Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hi there, YouTube. The Dapper Dinosaur here, yet again with some fresh creationist nonsense, or rather, like, year-old creationist nonsense. But then again, it's not like they update their talking points more than once every few decades, no matter how wrong they are, so I guess it doesn't really matter all that much. Anyway, we're going to take a look at a talk given by Andrew Stelling at the Creation Museum. Before that, I want to ask all of you to please like this video and subscribe to this channel. YouTube is a very fickle thing, and the only way for this channel to grow is if viewers like you help it. Anyway, here's Ken Ham saying stuff before he lets Snelling get on with it. Thanks for joining us in Legacy Hall to hear from my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Andrew Snelling. As you'll be able to tell from his lack of an American accent, Dr. Snelling comes from down under just like me. He's a geologist and research scientist with a PhD in geology from the University of Sydney in Australia. He is, and the funny thing about that is that he's a geologist who publishes completely ordinary science in peer-reviewed venues, where he doesn't espouse any kind of young earth creationist stuff. Then he turns around and contradicts himself in creationist venues. He also just blatantly lies about rocks for creationists, so congrats on getting a PhD geologist, Ken, but I guess we know which of the three among honest, well-informed, and creationist you went with. This time it's well-informed, creationist, but not honest. Because remember, you can't be all three. He's worked in exploration and mining industries all across Australia before starting in full-time creation ministry and research. Dr. Snelling now serves as director for the Answers in Genesis Research Department. He's also a popular speaker and author. You can find his resources, including his monumental work, Earth's Catastrophic Past, in our bookstore. Lying to the willingly ignorant is a lot easier than actually producing results useful to the mining industry, which, you know, has to actually hit deposits and can't rely on fantastical nonsense, like Ken Ham's ministry can. At this time, please silence all cell phones and note that emergency exits are located up front to your right and left and along the left side of the room. This is YouTube. Keep your cell phones on if you want. But also, thanks for telling me where to go if I need to run screaming from this video, Ken. Now, let's give our full attention and a warm welcome to my Aussie friend, Dr. Andrew Snell. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for, thanks for joining us. As Ken said, we've known one another for quite a long time. I first met Ken 40 years ago, and we've worked together for 30, coming on 35 years now. What I want to talk about this afternoon is fossils and rock layers, the flood, not evolution, and millions of years. I'll give Answers in Genesis props for this much. At least they actually have a PhD in geology, giving that their geology talk, instead of like a PhD in genetics, like Georgia Purdom, or a PhD in astrophysics like Jason Lyle. Often they have people completely outside of their own field. That being said, at least then I can pretend that the speakers are simply ill-informed rather than dishonest. I won't have that luxury here. Now we get presented in the museums and in textbooks this diagram that you can see on the screen. And many people are confused. Does that represent reality? Do we find rock layers stacked up like that? Do we find the fossils in that particular order? What about the labels on those rock layers? Are they for real? Can we trust what we see in the textbooks and in the museums? What is fact and what is fiction? As a rule of thumb, you can generally be pretty confident that if there is a broad scientific consensus on a particular topic, that that consensus is at least mostly correct. And so I want to answer to begin with these questions. Is the rock and fossil sequence real or is it simply contrived to make it support evolution and millions of years. So the evidence for the age of various rock layers, their general sequence, and even the fossils found in them, in no way depend on evolution. In fact, before evolution was even proposed, geologists were working this out. And while they could only give vague estimates of the age of the Earth based on how long it would take to simply deposit the rocks that are extant, they still knew that an age of only some 10,000 years or so was completely out of the question as being far, far too young. The fact that evolutionary theory and geology are concordant isn't a conspiracy. It's a result of our models of geology and our models of biology being largely correct. Does it show evolution in the development of life through this so-called geologic column? Yes, although not with nearly as much detail as we'd like, but far more than we could expect. And does it date the rocks as millions of years old according to the geologic time scale? 
No, the rocks and fossils per se do not date themselves. People have to do that. And when they do, we know for a fact that the Earth is not thousands of years old. It's billions of years old. And that much of the rock is hundreds of thousands or more years old. Many of you will be familiar with those terms and those, those terminology. You see these diagrams in museums and textbooks that life has supposedly developed from the first chemicals that produced the first cell that diverged through time over millions of years, branching into all different organisms that we see today. Well, the fossils do help us with some of that, but the evidence connecting plants and animals is primarily molecular, not fossil. However, within plants and animals, we do in fact have a lot of wonderful transitional forms linking major groups of organisms within those kingdoms. And you see this diagram and references to the Paleozoic and the Permian and the Carboniferous and all these names that are supposed to represent a geological time scale representing millions of years for the development of life on Earth. So these are the issues we want to come face to face with this afternoon. I'm going to shock you by first of all telling you that the rock layers are real. I mean, good. You can literally just go walk outside in many areas of the world and have a look at them. So at least Snelling has that right. Now the en other interesting thing is that the local rock sequences, so for example, you can drive all around Cincinnati and you can see that there's some variations where you go up and down, that there is a sequence of rock layers in this area. Well, they generally follow, the local rock sequences generally follow the order that's depicted in the geologic column. Yep, because shockingly, the geological column wasn't described as part of a conspiracy to get everyone to stop believing in God. It was just the result of looking at the data and going where they lead. And so the layers here in Cincinnati, you can compare with layers in other parts of the world, in exactly the same section of the geologic column, it seems to fit. In fact, the local rock sequences can be connected together across regions and continents in much the same order as the geologic column. Yep, that's one of the reasons we know about ancient supercontinents. So, for example, we can go northeast from here up to Caesar Creek State Park and look at the rock layers that are slightly higher in the sequence. You know, we can trace those all the way to Niagara Falls. So far, Snelling is doing pretty well. We can go south down the, two, uh, the, down the 75 and we go up the sequence as well and we can trace those layers and uh, I'm going to give you some examples shortly. And the other interesting thing is the fossils contained in the rock sequences generally follow the order of the fossil record. Now that might surprise you. Well, it shouldn't because it's not fabricated when they do those diagrams. Weird, right? Scientists aren't just lying to you and each other. But why do I feel like there's a but coming? But, but, I knew it. The caveat is, in those diagrams, they don't show you all the fossils that are found in the rock layers. I mean, yeah, you couldn't fit detailed pictures of every paleotaxon found in any given sequence of rock. This is like supposed to be a poster or even a page in a textbook, not a mural spanning a whole room. I'm going to say that unless Dr. Snelling can manage to show every single fossil taxon known at the time of this recording in his presentation, then he's just being dishonest in this criticism. And the thing is, I don't really think that it's a criticism he's trying to make. I think he's just being sloppy. I suspect that what he's actually trying to say here is that there are some selected taxa that are typically excluded from such pictures because in his mind they show some kind of problem for the theory of evolution or the great age of the earth. But if that's what's going on here, we should have said that. They choose the ones that tell the supposed story of evolutionary development. No, they pick the ones that are generally popular with their audience and that are stereotypical of the given rock system and therefore paleo environment. If you take into account all the fossils that are found in each and every rock layer, they tell a different story. But we'll come to that in a moment. Different than what? The scientific consensus? Because that consensus is built upon what is found in the rocks, as Snelling has already pointed out. First of all, let's journey out to the southwestern United States, to the Grand Canyon area. A place I've been to a few times, just a few months ago most recently, where I was joined by some fellow counter-creationists like R.J. Downard. I even got my copy of The Rocks Were There signed by him. Now to get Jackson Wheat out to the Grand Canyon so I can make him sign it too. Why do we go to the Grand Canyon? Why is it such a good place? Well. To put it bluntly, the biology doesn't cover up the geology because it's a desert. 
So the rock layers are exposed to view and it's a slice through the rock layers that you don't find anywhere else in the world. Well, there are other canyons and exposures, but the Grand Canyon is especially dramatic and the rock layers there are especially obvious, even to casual observers. And if you didn't notice them, just stop in at basically any visitor center in the park, they'll be sure to tell you about the layers. But do bring a mask, because as of the time of this recording, and to the best of my knowledge, masks are required inside all the buildings on the park, with the exception of inside hotel rooms, dining areas, and private dwellings. Not only have you got the Grand Canyon, but you go northwards from the Grand Canyon, up a series of cliffs, like a giant staircase, in fact it's called the Giant Staircase. Well it's called the Grand Staircase, but that just means the Big Staircase, so... Okay. You eventually climb up to the Zion Canyon area and you go a little bit higher up to Bryce Canyon. You've actually climbed from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top of Bryce Canyon. You've climbed through 15,000 feet of rock layers containing fossils. Well, here they are. This is a view in the Western Grand Canyon where you can see the narrowest part of the Colorado River right there. It's called Granite Narrows. And uh, down there is the crystalline basement rocks that we believe match what we, we would expect from the description in Genesis of what happened during the creation week. And then we've got a few layers stacked on, on top of that that don't have any fossils in them. They probably represent pre-flood sedimentary layers because there was erosion and sedimentation in the pre-flood world. But even your so-called pre-flood rocks show signs of things like metamorphic change in the Vishnu cyst. And pre or not, the sedimentary rocks of the Supai supergroup should still have fossils if they were formed when macroscopic life was abundant, which is the claim of creationists. Even without animal death or something like that, we should still expect to see things like trilobite sheds, pollen, leaves, etc., all of which readily fossilize and are common in environments with those organisms. As apparently, this was. Again, according to the creationists, so the lack of fossils in the supergroup rocks is actually a major problem for flood geology. But then we come to an erosion surface and above that erosion surface, which marks the onset of the flood, you've got all these layers in the walls of the canyon that contain all these fossils. Nothing about the Great Unconformity indicates that it was the start of a flood. For one thing, floods don't cause the uplift, evident in the basement rocks and supergroup rocks. So you're going to need something else to explain why they were uplifted. But the erosion at the Great Unconformity is in fact an open question in science, and Snelling has not solved it by simply proclaiming, the flood did it. And so they're the flood layers. Except we have things like limestone and subaerial sandstone, which, you know, can't form in a flood. Further, we have fine-grained shale in these rocks, without flocculation, which again, can't form in a flood. Even the conglomerates of the Grand Canyon aren't graded, so they're unlikely to be the result of a flood, and the conglomerates would be your best bet for flood-caused rocks. Well, that's the western Grand Canyon. Let's go to the beginning of the Grand Canyon, to where we actually launch on our raft trips. Uh, we're right there at river level. You can see the rock layer that is normally you find at the, top, at the top of the Grand Canyon. So we've actually gone upstream, up through the, the layers, and we're back now at river level. We're at the, at the level you'd normally be at the top of the Grand Canyon. And we can look northwards and we start to see these other cliffs that make up the giant staircase. We've got the chocolate cliffs, we've got the vermilion cliffs, we go even further, we go to Mount Zion, uh, to Zion Canyon, and we've got the white cliffs. And finally, you go higher up, you get to the pink cliffs. So as I said, at, at Bryce Canyon. So what I, as I said, you can actually climb from the bottom of the Grand Canyon through 15,000 feet, almost three miles thickness, of rock layers containing fossils. Let's hope there's a point to this. That are the record of the flood, from our perspective. So that whole thing was just a setup to what you believe about geology? Okay, I hope there's something to back that up. So the layers are real, and the sequence is real. What about the fossils we find in this sequence? Well, we start in the pre-flood rocks, those sedimentary rocks, they don't have any major fossils. They have microfossils and algae and trace fossils. But why is that? Those sedimentary rocks should preserve some things that are easy to preserve. Let's take trilobites as an example. The neat thing about trilobites is that their exoskeleton was mineralized, unlike what you'd see in an insect. Instead of being basically just chitin, they were mostly calcite and calcium phosphate held in a lattice of chitin. 
This means that chemically they were very similar to your bones, although not identical. This means that these shells are basically pre-fossilized, rather like a clamshell. Further, unlike with bivalves, trilobites had to shed their shells in life. Like all arthropods, trilobites couldn't grow while their exoskeleton was hard, so periodically they shed it. At this point, they would expand their size, probably in about the same way as a lobster, that is by taking in water and essentially inflating themselves like a balloon. Then the new exoskeleton would harden and they would grow into it. This results in a ready-made fossil exoskeleton that has essentially no nutritional value, so it's very unlikely to be scavenged, and it's also already basically a rock, so it doesn't need any special preservation to occur for it to be found in the fossil record. So any sedimentation happening in an area with trilobites living in it is basically guaranteed to preserve some shed exoskeletons, and that's one of the reasons why shed trilobite carapaces are one of the most common fossils anywhere where Paleozoic rocks are exposed. So why is it that the Bass Limestone and the Dock Sandstone, which are, according to Snelling, pre-flood deposits laid down by the same kinds of forces we see operating today, have no trilobite fossils? He says that trilobites were alive at the time. Similarly, in the Dock Sandstone, we would expect at least some plant fossils, since some of the deposits are from rivers and estuaries, and plants shed leaves, spores, seeds, pollen, etc. And according to Snelling, there were fully developed and thriving ecosystems before the flood. The kind of thing that you would expect from life that was crawling around in the pre-flood world, there weren't the conditions in the pre-flood world that would have, would have uh, fossilised elephants or, or, or dinosaurs because they're big creatures and you need catastrophic conditions to bury them on, on mass. And mass? Yes. At all? No. But like I just said, we do have the conditions needed for lots of fossils that we should find, even if we accept Stelling's implication that floods are needed to preserve larger organisms. It's only when you get to that line across the bottom there, which is the erosion surface that marks the beginning of the flood, we call it the great unconformity. It's a technical term for an erosion surface where everything just gets eroded off. It's more than just an erosion surface. It's also a time gap, as indicated by the dating of the rocks involved. But I think Snelling may elsewhere get into why he rejects the science on the dates of rocks later and in more depth. So I'll save that discussion for later. But then we get these layers which have all these fossils in them. And so initially we have trilobites uh, and, and clams and, and sponges and echinoderms and gastropods or snails. And as we go up through the sequence of the Grand Canyon rock layers, we've only got marine fossils. The Tepit sandstone is definitely not a flood deposit, and we've known this for decades. For one thing, it includes ichnofossils, that is, traces of ancient life that are not derived from the remains of ancient life in the form of burrows. This alone precludes this from being a flood deposit, as one of the most important things about turbidite, which is what you get when rock is deposited by a flood, is that it erases any signs of bioturbation, such as burrows, tracks, etc. Further, the cross-bending grain size and facie sequence of the tapetes are completely in line with modern depositional environments, such as a shallow marine tidal area, then upstream some estuaries, then farther upstream braided streams. In order to suggest instead it is a flood deposit, we would need to show how a flood could deposit something that has for decades been known to be concordant with shallow, fresh, and salt water environments with tidal deposition, even could be laid down in a flood. And spoiler alert, it can't be. Instead, the only reasonable interpretation is to include that it was formed in the way that it appears based on the deposition we can watch now, that is, in a shallow marine and coastal freshwater area. I want to be clear here. Saying the Tapete Sandstone is a flood deposit sounds to anyone who knows anything about geology about as reasonable as saying it's made of cotton candy. It's absurd on the face of it, and it flies in the face of all reason and evidence. Andrew Snelling knows this. He is lying to you. We've only got marine fossils apart from some tracks of vertebrate animals. I'll show you those in a moment too. Now, as we go northwards up the grand staircase, what do we find? We find, sorry, wrong way. We find, we start to get not only clams, but we start to get terrestrial animals. They're bones, and we're getting a mixture of fresh and water and, and marine creatures, which you'd expect as the flood came up onto the land, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But we increasingly get land fossils, uh, land fossils as the waters cover the land. So the thing here is that Snelling is kind of right about what a flood should do. He's just wrong that that's what we see in the rock layers. You see, a couple years ago, in 2019, a fossil bed was described by scientists, including Walter Alvarez, the son of the father-son team that first proposed the Yucatan impact site was the cause of the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. It seems to have been caused by the very same impact. 
And this is not just a flood deposit, but it's a flood caused by a tsunami, which is the kind of thing young Earth creationists envision in their ideas about the flood. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we should expect to see from such an event. First, there are no ichnofossils or signs of bioturbation. Second, second, the animals include a strange mix of coastal marine and freshwater organisms, along with a lot of debris and land animals. But that mix of marine and freshwater is important. You see, the marine creatures were swept up onto higher ground, but in the formations that Stelling is describing, we frequently do not have marine organisms mixed in, instead we get freshwater life, as Snelling put on his slide, such as in the Chinle Formation and the Moanav Formation. If this were a flood sweeping organisms up from the depths, then we should expect marine life all through these layers. We don't find that. Now you might ask why the fish and land animals are mixed together. Well, it's simply because when things die, sometimes they fall into water, even if they don't live there. And most of these deposits were made by water, in the case of the Chinle, for example, by braided streams. Interestingly, Snelling doesn't bother to include the Coconino sandstone in this list, and that wasn't even formed by water, but by wind in an arid desert. And so that sequence is exactly the same as what we find in that diagram. Well, yeah, both lists are based on the fossils known in those formations. But also remember, when Snelling complained about the first list he showed not telling us about all the fossils, well, he didn't do so either. Why the double standard? Is it because if it weren't for double standards, creationists wouldn't have any at all? If you look at that diagram, the middle column there, you'll see drawings at the bottom of marine life, and it's only higher up do you get the animal life. That bottom row had Dickinsonia, an Ediacaran animal. There are animals all through the chart. What in the world is Snelling smoking? Just because it doesn't have fins or teeth doesn't mean you don't have an animal on your hands. And so it does fit the general order what we find in the Grand Canyon Grand Staircase areas does fit the, the order that we see depicted in this diagram. Which interestingly also fits evolutionary predictions and doesn't fit into what a flood would do. So, how should we respond to this information? Because after all, God doesn't lie. God might not lie, but Andrew Snelling sure does. So if the rock sequences and fossils record, uh, 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 the fossils rock sequences and fossil record are real, how can we explain them? Now, of course, we have to start with God's word because it's our authority. God was there, he created, and he's recorded for us the true history of the earth. No, that's not what we should do. Look, the physical universe predates the Bible, and the Bible's existence is contingent upon the physical universe. If anything in the universe contradicts your reading of the Bible, then either you're reading it wrong, or the Bible is wrong. So when you go to examine the world in a scientific manner, you might as well toss out the Bible, because it's irrelevant. And you know what? In his actual science, that's what Snelling does. He knows that the Bible is irrelevant to any geological inquiry. In fact, it's irrelevant to most research, except research on the Bible itself. If you're going to start off with the Bible with the unstated assumption that your interpretation is correct, then you're starting off with no way to know if you're wrong. And you're starting off with a conclusion and forcing the facts to fit it. That is the opposite of science. Good science takes you where the data lead. It does not lead the data to your pet hypothesis. That's just dishonest. The Bible is God's history book of the universe. In fact, the reality is it's his story. What do I mean by that? It's all about Jesus Christ. It starts with Jesus as the creator. And in the middle, you've got Jesus as the redeemer. And at the end, you've got Jesus, the coming king. Cool story, bro. But guess what? If Jesus created the universe, he did it 13.77 billion years ago, and if he's king, it's over a planet where life evolved and humans are apes. I don't really care to argue about what the Bible is about, but no matter what it's about, it's not something you can glean a literal history of the universe from. And if you try, you'll end up being wrong, and perhaps, as is the case with Andrew Snelling, you'll start lying for Jesus. Because to you, having people believe in Jesus because you lie to them is more important than your own integrity. He then spends an inordinate amount of time just telling us what the Bible says according to his interpretation. I already know this, you already know this, I'm not including it. However, I had to listen to it and it was infuriatingly long-winded and pointless. The secular time scale says, no, man is only a late arrival. The universe began 13.7 billion years ago. The earth formed four and a half billion years ago. When he says secular, what he means is evidence-based science and not theological book club, because that's how he has admitted he's coming to his conclusion. Not based on evidence, but based on the word of man, because that's what the Bible is, even if it's also inspired. On the other hand, the physical universe, if it was created by God, 
has to be his actual word because no humans made it. So whether there's a God or not, evidence is how we should find out about the world. And we shouldn't let any book convince us of what is evidently untrue. Either find a new way to read that book or stop taking it seriously. And I want to point out that a lot of people who take the Bible quite seriously are not young earth creationists or in any other way contradicting science. It was a hot molten blob. Well, they're wrong because God said when he created it was covered in water. It was cool. It wasn't hot. No, if they're wrong, it would not be because the Bible said so. It would be because the evidence shows that the earth was a cool lump of rock covered in water. The evidence does not indicate that. And the Bible says the earth was created first, not the sun. Then we would find that when we check the age of the earth against that of other things in the solar system, we'd find that it's older via things like radiometric dating. Instead, we find that this whole solar system formed about at the same time, around 4.5 billion years ago. That's just what the evidence says. Sorry if your interpretation of the Bible disagrees with the hard facts of science, but there it is. Not all religious beliefs are tenable. The scientists say the sun was first and the earth later, so who's right? God was there, the scientists weren't. I mean, kinda. The protostar that was to become the sun did start being identifiable before the earth started to form, but at this point, everything is just kind of forming together around the same time. But if God was there, he evidently didn't feel like it was important to get an accurate record of the formation of the solar system into his word. Unless you want to say that he did, but he also arranged everything to look exactly as if it formed the way science says it did. That seems a bit dishonest of him to say the least. After this, Snelling rants again for almost two minutes about his theology. Again, I don't care, so I cut it out. So what do we find in the fossil record? Is the fossil record a record of life? By definition, fossils are traces of ancient life. So yes, fossils are traces of life. The collection of all extant fossils is the fossil record. Fossils exist, therefore the fossil record is a record of life. Ha! Huh. That's a record of death. You can't record death without also recording life. As far as we can tell, you can't record life for a very long time without also recording death. They are two sides of the same biological coin. I don't mean to start an existential crisis here, but as far as we can tell, death is one of the most certain things about life. You see living things crawling around in the rocks? No, you see dead things. Actually, you see both. That's why when you're doing chemical tests on fossils, you have to be careful of contamination by recent organisms. And you see evidence of carn carnivory. Turns out that animals are full of nutrients and are easy to digest, so of course you see carnivory going all the way back to the Cambrian fossils. Animals eating and not animals. We see evidence of cancer, broken teeth, fractures that are healed, so there was violence. I'm sorry, so is he saying that before the fall, bones were infinitely strong? So if a human fell out of a tree, they wouldn't ever have broken a wrist? Talk about eisegesis. We also find fossilized thorns in the fossil record that are claimed to be 400 million years old. Now, but, but wait a minute. The Bible has a specific statement about thorns. When did thorns come into existence? Did God create thorns initially? No. Thorns came as a result of the curse after Adam and Eve sinned. So that means thorns couldn't precede Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Again, cool story, bro, but um, the thorns are 400 million years old. And saying the Bible contradicts that means literally nothing to the claim. Adam and Eve couldn't have been walking on a fossil graveyard in the Garden of Eden because that would be a record of death and destruction before they arrived. In the creation myth of Genesis, sure, but Snelling is supposed to be a geologist. And the way that geology definitely does not work is by throwing out all evidence in order to make an ancient myth literal history. But that's what the secularists say. You see, we know they are wrong because thorns are specifically mentioned in scripture. They come after Adam and Eve's sin, so they can't be millions and millions of years old. You see, there's a radically different view of the world then the only sane thing to conclude is that Adam and Eve did not literally exist as described in Genesis. Any other conclusion, knowing what Snelling knows, is intellectually dishonest. The secularists say, no, death and disease and suffering and bloodshed brought you and I into existence. Nature read in tooth and claw, but the Bible says, no, it was man who sinned that brought death. Anytime he says secularist, remember that what he means is people who care about evidence. So how do we explain the fossils? If Adam and Eve weren't walking on a fossil graveyard in the Garden of Eden because God had created a very good world to begin with, so there couldn't be dead dinosaurs under their feet, when did, when did the dinosaurs die? Well, there was a catastrophe. See, that's the significance of the flood. Look, man, I actually think the death connection to immoral behavior is cool. 
It underlines the importance of moral action and avoiding morally reprehensible action. You see, someone could look at the Bible and come away with a sense of how serious morality is. Or could look at it and come away believing crazy things like that thorns didn't exist millions of years ago, despite the evidence of millions of years old thorns. And let's not forget, Dr. Stelling has not actually given us our reason beyond Bible to say that these thorns are not as old as the evidence indicates. But I think that is where we're going to cut it off for our first episode looking at Andrew Snelling. Thank you very much. Again, if you enjoyed this video, please do hit like, subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit the bell. I just want to take a moment to thank my channel members and my patrons on Patreon. They really help keep the lights on here. And I want to thank those pledging $20 or above, especially Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bede, Pat L. Dennis, and Res Instance. Without the support of those whose names you see on screen right now, the channel simply wouldn't exist as it does now, and I certainly wouldn't be able to do two to three videos a week for over a year and a half now. If you would like to help support and make it so that this channel is something that can keep going, there is a link to join below the video, as well as a link to the Patreon in the channel description. If pledging money isn't right for you, please just hit like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and share my videos. That really helps my channel grow.